This video is brought to you by Manscaped.com. Christmas came early this year because I was gifted the new performance package by Manscaped. Manscaped created the world's first all-in-one men's grooming kit that has you covered from head to toe. The Lawnmower 4.0 waterproof cordless trimmer is built with advanced skin safe technology, which helps reduce nicks and cuts on your most sensitive areas. Your jingle balls will thank you. It also has this cool LED light, which is really helpful for grooming on those cold, dark winter nights. The performance package comes with a Crop Preserver Ball Deodorant and the Crop Reviver Ball Toner Spray. This is a game changer. New to the collection is the Weed Whacker Nose and Ear Hair Trimmer. The Weed Whacker has 360 degree rotary blades and the same skin safe technology from the trimmer, so it helps prevent tugging and tears in your nose and ears. Manscaped is no longer for just below the waist grooming either. In addition to products for your face, they now have you covered from head to toe with their new and improved Shears 2.0 Luxury 6-Piece Stainless Steel Nail Kit. For a limited time, you'll also get two free gifts, the shared travel bag and the Manscaped anti-chafing boxer briefs. So go to manscaped.com and use my promo code FCE to get 20% off free international shipping plus two free gifts. Come with me if you want to live. It's okay, Mom. He's here to help. We made a huge video exploring the philosophical musings, narrative, and the immense production process of the first Terminator film, links in the description. Moving the series forward, Terminator 2 has long been regarded by many as one of the best action flicks of all time, and one of the greatest sequels ever made. In it, an advanced cybernetic assassin, identical to the one who failed to kill Sarah Connor in the first film, must now protect her son from a more advanced and powerful Terminator. By looking closer, we can really appreciate the finesse which James Cameron and his team brought to the project, both in the narrative and technical department. And given the very dark fate of where the series now is, it's no wonder why this movie has stood the test of time. Hey guys, what's happening? Niat here with Film Comics Explained. And today, we're exploring the legacy of Terminator 2 Judgment Day, James Cameron's heart-thumping sci-fi action blockbuster, starring Linda Hamilton, Edward Furlong, Joe Morton, Arnold Schwarzenegger, and Robert Patrick as the T-1000. So this other guy, he's a Terminator like you, right? Not like me. The T-1000. Advanced prototype. The T-1000, also known as the Prototype Series 1000 Terminator, is essentially an android shape-shifting assassin sent back in time to kill John Connor. Created by the franchise's main antagonist, Skynet, the T-1000 is described in Terminator 2 as being composed of a liquid metal mimetic poly alloy that it could manipulate to assume various forms. I talk about Skynet and the T-800 in other videos listed in my massive Terminator playlist, which I'll be leaving links to below, and I highly recommend that you guys check them out. With that being said, aside from being able to camouflage itself by assuming the appearance of nondescript objects and the likeness of humans it terminated, the T-1000's shape-shifting abilities enabled it to form its hands into stabbing blades, slip through physical openings by oozing its liquid form, and instantly reform itself from any physical damage. In the prologue of the film's novelization, it's further explained that the T-1000 was created through nanotechnology and was a nanomorph able to scan the molecular structure of whatever it's touching before successfully mimicking its visual appearance. In Terminator 2, the T-1000's default form is portrayed by the legendary Robert Patrick, while other actors portrayed the T-1000 in the disguise of specific characters. The infiltration unit was described as a technological leap over the 800 series Terminator. You made more advanced than you are? Yes, a mimetic poly alloy. What the hell does that mean? Liquid metal. As mentioned before, it could use its ability to quickly liquefy and assume forms in innovative and surprising ways, including fitting through narrow openings, morphing its arms into solid metal tools or bladed weapons, walking through prison bars, flattening itself and imitating the pattern and texture of the ground to hide or ambush its targets. The T-1000 also had the ability to extrude small, simple items from itself. For example, it created a motorcycle helmet and sunglasses when these items were necessary for its disguise. It could also change its surface color and texture to convincingly simulate flesh, clothing, and other non-metallic materials. 
It was capable of accurately mimicking voices as well, including the ability to extrapolate a relatively small voice sample to generate a wide array of words or inflections as required. However, its morphing abilities were limited by complexity, mass, and volume, and as such, it could not transform into complex machines with mechanical moving parts or chemical fuels, like guns or bombs. Its volume also prevented it from taking the form of smaller objects like a pack of cigarettes, although it was capable of impersonating larger people, most likely by simply making its interior hollow. Like all the Terminators featured in the series, the T-1000 possessed superhuman strength. While relatively equal to the T-800, thanks to its morphing abilities and immunity to mechanical damage, it is shown overpowering the T-800 in hand-to-hand -hand combat, despite its more slender frame and lack of mass compared to its predecessor. It can also run fast enough to catch up to a car accelerating away from it, though it was more than capable of commandeering vehicles when required. You okay? Fine. Say, that's a nice bike. Get out. The T-1000 is effectively impervious to physical injury, and any damage to its body would only momentarily stagger it for as long as it took to repair the wound or deformation. Bullet wounds were a minor inconvenience, however, a high kinetic impact from a shotgun blast or a large explosion would knock it out for a few moments before it could recover. If a part of its body is detached, it will liquefy and flow back into the T-1000's body, with its detached nanoparts able to track the core of the body from a great distance. In the prologue to the novel adaptation, it's explained that the T-1000 was able to completely reform and reshape itself at will, due to its cells having been programmed by Skynet with onboard nanotechnologies. The unit is also not specifically designed to encounter other Terminators, and has little knowledge of their diagnostics, and this allowed the T-800 to take it by surprise. In the film, the T-1000 forcefully shut the T-800 down, but did not know of the older model's emergency reboot power mode, which enabled it to get back up. Hasta la vista, baby. Its weaknesses appear to be extreme temperatures, similar to those that would have been used during its creation. In the film, when it was frozen solid from a coating of liquid nitrogen, it could not move. It was then shot by the Terminator and split into several pieces. However, the heat from a nearby crucible thawed out the individual pieces, allowing it to liquefy moments before the T-1000 began reforming its body. After it was hit with a grenade launcher, it was so distorted and off balance from the gap in its torso that it slipped and fell into a molten steel vat, which caused it to shapeshift uncontrollably into its human victims. The machine was then seen turning itself inside out trying to shield itself, but was permanently destroyed when the searing heat disassembled its nanotechnological cells on a microscopic level. The extended edition of Judgment Day also contained additional scenes in the steel foundry, showing that the damaging effects of being frozen, shattered, and thawed caused the T-1000 to glitch, and as a result, the assassin began to uncontrollably morph, matching its surface with objects it came into contact with against its will. This glitch enabled John to see through its ruse when it impersonated his mother, as its feet took on the color and texture of the grated metal floor on which it stood. Interestingly, the DVD also contains a deleted scene where the T-1000 used its hands to scan John Connor's bedroom for genetic and psychological information, an ability it had in common with the TX seen in Terminator 3 Rise of the Machines. The T-1000 series were subtle infiltrators that would often accomplish their goals through cunning and deception, instead of the brute force and extreme violence used by the T-800s. In T-2, it disguised itself as a police officer to gain trust and access information, and its benign friendly face enabled it to gain the information it needed to locate John Connor. Do you have a photograph of John? Yeah, sure, hold on. He's a good looking boy. Do you mind if I keep this picture? No, go on. In the end, despite not succeeding in this mission, the T-1000 was one of the most efficient infiltrator units as it was able to successfully pass as a human, using a large repertoire of emotional expressions and interpersonal skills that the earlier Terminators lacked. That's good. Maybe you could practice in front of a mirror or something. Up with the future as a message to her. The future's not set. 
There's no fit but what we make for ourselves. T2 has three key narrative beats. First, a Terminator is once again sent back from the future, but this time is tasked with protecting John Connor, and with the Terminator defending John from an upgraded Terminator model, the machine slowly morphs into a father figure for John. Second, Sarah Connor masterminds a plan to stop Skynet from ever being created by killing its creator, Miles Dyson. This transforms Sarah into a ruthless killing machine, contrasting her previous persona. She almost perfectly reverses the arc found in the T101. Throughout the first film, she was emotionally active, both in terms of passion and fear, but in this film, she's become cold and utilitarian, seeing John's survival as a must, not as a result of loving or cherishing him. Instead of being a helpless waitress who's thrown into this crazy world of robots and nuclear holocaust, she has a much more active role in her own fate this time round. She goes further than this when she decides to take down Dyson, essentially transforming herself into a human Terminator, dressing in military attire and packing weapons as she sneaks onto Dyson's property to clinically assassinate him. But instead of killing him, they end up working together and blow up his life's work. In this way, the film is as much about her redemption as it is the Terminator's. Your heart and your mind are in here. I'm sorry. How about spending some time with your other babies? Interestingly, Miles Dyson also subverts the very idea of a villainous mastermind that needs to be defeated. Although he could be blamed for creating Skynet and setting the cogs in motion which result in the future war, the Dyson we see doesn't scream human extinction. Instead, we see this. Raging waters! Yay! He's simply a man working tirelessly at his passion, and when told about the ramifications of his breakthroughs, he opts to upend his life's work for the greater good. I worked a lot of years on this thing. Yes! With the T-1000 ruthlessly pursuing them along the way, they manage to destroy it before the Protector sacrifices himself to wipe out any trace of Skynet in the present, stopping the future war from ever happening. Who sent you? You did. This of course is paradoxical. Future John in the midst of the 21st century war sends back Arnold's T-101 to protect his younger self, who then succeeds in destroying the building blocks of Skynet and the Terminators. It's the classic grandfather paradox, with Arnold essentially coming back in time to kill his grandfather, the original Skynet microchip, which begs the question, how could he have ever existed to come back in time? You're talking about things that I haven't done yet in the past tense. Come on, do I look like the mother of the future? The first film essentially subscribes to hard determinism. It suggests that time is pre-written. In other words, Sarah is bound to become the battle-hardened woman and not die at the end. Otherwise, John would never have been born to force Skynet to send the Terminator back in time in the first place. Terminator 2 refreshes and refutes the ways that the original film deals with paradoxes, and boy is it explicit. While the Terminator seems to subscribe to a level of hard determinism, in T2, Sarah quite literally scrolls no fate for us and the other characters to read. This of course directly relates to T2's narrative trajectory, which tries to pull off the grandfather paradox, getting rid of Dyson, or at least his work, in order to stop the future war from ever taking place. This ideology of no fate burrows deeper into Sarah and John. Sarah pulls it out whenever they're in danger, exclaiming to John, you cannot risk yourself even for me, do you understand? And John often explaining, The future's not set. There's no fit but what we make for ourselves. More subtly, this is also seen in Sarah's physical transformations, seen first in her bulking up while incarcerated in the mental institution, and later through her decision to take on a kitted out military look. Putting this together, T2 clearly places far more importance on personal action and choice, sidelining the fateful ideologies of the first film, even if that means ripping apart the laws of physics to achieve this. Looking at technique, Cameron splits the film in half, nailing a clear visual divide between warm orange hues and cold blue hues. While this contrast between blue and orange has long been favourable in cinema, thanks to the colours being perfectly opposing, T2 employs these colour oppositions to help support our characters and their narrative arcs. Used for traditional moods, oranges in the film come at moments of intimacy and high tension, such as the trio's retreat in Mexico, or the film's final sequence, while blues couple with the cold T-1000 and accompany moments of emotional withdrawal and weakness. The film goes a step further, often including split lighting across one character's face, casting it in light and shadow, going further to reinforce their inner divisions between good and evil. These distinctive partitions in the film's use of lighting not only lend themselves to creating memorable images, but further underpin the narrative's thematic goals, turning Arnold's Terminator from this to this. Oh, don't do it! Please, don't go! I know now why you cry. 
helping to achieve the film's ultimate goal of humanizing a machine that nearly made us pee our pants the first time round. Come with me if you want to live. In addition to expanding on the philosophical discussions of determinism and choice, transforming and humanizing the main villain into a hero, and ramping up the action, T2 employs powerful narrative and visual techniques to ensure that the film's story beats hit twice as hard. And this is a philosophy which permeates the entire film, from the VFX to the film's extreme action. Every moment is there to support the narrative, develop our characters, and reinforce its themes. It was inevitable that a Terminator sequel would get made. We wanted to make sure it didn't kind of drift off the concept of what it should be about. When it came to creating a Terminator sequel, James Cameron didn't cut any corners. This was not a phoned-in cash grab, but a carefully planned out sequel in this terrifying sci-fi world. Cameron had initially come up with the idea for Judgment Day shortly after the release of the first film in 1984, yet it took until 1991 to actually bring the film to the big screen. He worked on Aliens and the Abyss in the interim, before Coralco Pictures finally bought the rights for the sequel. While the first film was a risky leap of faith that was produced on a shoestring budget of 6.4 million, by T2, both Cameron and his ideas for Terminator were much more established. This time around, the film had an enormous budget between 94 to 102 million dollars, making it the most expensive to date, at 15 times the first film's budget. Cameron even joked that by that point, the original movie's budget wouldn't even cover Schwarzenegger's salary. The way he goes about directing actors, how much time he spends with rehearsals, how much time he spends with perfection and with moves and gestures. That's why people always say that the Jim Cameron movie has a certain look because it's a total representation of what he wants to see. Armed with a fat budget and the classic Cameron ambition to raise the bar, the first draft of T2 is about 140 pages long and written over the course of six weeks. James and his longtime friend William Wisher went all in on this draft, saying that they put in every possible scene we wanted to see, even though we knew some of them would be cut for time and money. After a bit of editing, they pared the script down to 120 pages. Even after trimming it down, the story was still going to be action-packed and very expensive. Co-producer BJ Rack took one look at it and recalled being horrified. Every sequence was like the ending of Die Hard. It was going to be one of the biggest pictures ever made. Arnold and I working together, it's just, it's just like it was on the first picture. He's one of the most professional people I've ever worked with, and it's really a joy to work with him. Perhaps the biggest change in the story between this movie and the last is with the Terminator's characterization. Cameron was somewhat surprised to see that more people connected with the big bad Terminator than they did with Sarah Connor. For some reason, people adored the villain, and Cameron didn't want to give them more of the same thing. On top of that, Arnie's newfound star status meant that he couldn't be marketed as just another evil bad guy. So it was a story decision as well as a career decision for the sake of Arnie's reputation. Is it something worth dedicating a year of your life and dedicating all of this money and time and energy to show Arnold, who's looked up to by millions of kids, blowing up people with a machine gun? I say no, Cameron explained during a 91 interview. Many films guide you towards admiration of a violent character, and they can never recover from that on a moral level. Thus, the Terminator was reworked to be a hero and a father figure for John, and the story benefits greatly because of it. By taking this approach, it helped transcend T2 from just being another action flick. In 1984, he paid a lot of attention to the acting. He pays much more attention to the acting now. So I would say that in that area, he's much smarter and much more sophisticated. The process of acquiring new actors for the sequel was carefully calculated, as the roles of John Connor in the T-1000 had to be perfectly cast for the film to work. Cameron stressed how important John's character was, saying that he needed a professional and he couldn't be working with an amateur new kid. I didn't want him to be just some little, some little jock kid that looked like he could handle anything. He had to have a quality that needed protecting. Amazingly, this was Edward Furlong's first role. Initially, his lack of experience almost knocked him off the shortlist, but they gave him another chance and he ended up being perfect for the role. Casting director Mally Finn explained just how difficult it was to get a professional kid who could pull off this tough kid role. And when they tried to act angry or tough, it just looked ridiculous. It didn't look real, it didn't look believable. When it came to casting the villain, Cameron was looking for someone with the opposite physique of Schwarzenegger. Strong, but with a more agile and dancer-like strength, as opposed to bulky bodybuilder muscles. Well, I wanted to find someone who would be a good contrast to Arnold and I wanted somebody who won through different means. And because so much computer graphics needed to be done, the role needed to be filled right away so that they could do all the composite shots in time. 
Early storyboards reportedly had the likeness of Billy Idol drawn in for the character, and there was a brief point in time where Cameron considered having the face of Kyle Reese plastered on the T-1000. While this was not Robert Patrick's first gig, he had been in Die Hard 2 as O'Reilly just a year before T2, his role as a T-1000 launched him into stardom. Patrick mentions that Cameron was looking for someone more unknown, so people wouldn't bring any preconceived biases to the character. It was supposed to create some sort of an intense presence, and I started playing around with that with Mally, and there was something she saw, and she said, whatever that is, you know, whatever you're doing right now, why don't you keep that going? In the audition, Patrick showcased a calculating, threatening aura that became the iconic characteristics of the T-1000. For Schwarzenegger, this new Terminator required him to bring a more sympathetic attitude to his role. He had to essentially modulate himself to read less big scary villain and more awkward robot dad. It was Linda Hamilton, however, who had to undergo some really radical changes to play this more badass version of Sarah Connor. You can see right away that Hamilton had to really beef up for this role, and the regiment she went through is pretty damn impressive. I trained for three months uh, with a personal trainer, free weights, aerobics, uh, up to 18 hours a week. According to an Entertainment Weekly interview, she also trained with an Israeli commando, Uzi Gal, and ate primarily skim milk, dressingless salads, and chicken. All this while taking care of her son Dalton, who was barely one years old at the time of filming. Quick fun fact, Hamilton's twin sister Leslie stood in for her during some stunt scenes and was actually one of the forms that the T-1000 takes when trying to trick John. Get out of the way, John! By now I think I've made my point. The story of T2 is comprehensive and epic, but the story isn't the only great thing here. I'd be remiss if I didn't talk about the insane special effects work that went into this film. Though a few of the computer-generated effects look dated by now, Industrial Light & Magic's work still holds up after all these years. As a little bit of background, Industrial Light & Magic is a visual effects company that was founded by George Lucas during the production of Star Wars. Cameron had worked with the company in 1989's The Abyss, and would work with them again for Titanic and Avatar. Truth be told, the effects are still inventive and impressive, even if us modern moviegoers are used to CGI trickery by now. It's actually quite amusing to hear a contemporary special effects feature at gush that the movie has more than 40 different shots of computer images, but that was a big deal at the time. The computer animators at ILM had the monumental task of generating more than 40 different shots of computer images. To give it some perspective, The Abyss had only one CGI sequence, but it practically derailed the whole film's scheduling because CGI was still such a new art form. Much of the film's sci-fi allure hinges on the special effects. Producer BJ Rack explained that the effects schedule basically drove the entire production. Sometimes we'd be shooting things so completely out of order that we might be shooting the first part of one scene two months or three months apart. Pure graphics, if treated wrong, will show very, very hard edges. And on film, you know, it just looks like a scrape on a car. According to ILM special effects coordinator Dennis Murin, there was a practical effects team on standby in case they couldn't pull off all of the CGI effects that they wanted. Stan Winston, who was responsible for the robotic effects in the first film, had created full-size T-1000 heads and arms in case they needed backup shots. Murin comments that a lot of these effects had never been done before with robotics either, so if the computer effects had fallen through, chances are their luck wouldn't have been much better on the practical side. That isn't to say that Winston didn't bring his practical effects expertise to other areas of the film, of course. With a bigger budget, he was able to create more advanced animatronics and build upon the original Terminator exoskeleton. You as an audience will not see the differences but it's much more technically advanced than the endoskeleton in the first movie. The battle sequence in the beginning is another fascinating example of practical effects magic. The SFX team created exoskeletons and blended miniatures with full-scale sets. The real trick is to not try to make the entire effect happen all at once. Break it up into component parts. Meanwhile, the explosions are mostly projected into the background, while screens layer extra animations. It's also worth mentioning that those silver bullets effects actually weren't CGI. As you can see chronicled here on the Stan Winston School's Instagram page, that was actually a practical effect created using slip rubber latex and polyfoam. What he has to do, now how are we going to do that? If you can do it with makeup, do it with makeup, allow an actor to do it. If you can't do it with makeup and you can't do it with robotics, then in comes the magic of the computer. The makeup effects are incredible throughout the movie as well. The prosthetics applied in order to make the Terminator's chrome skeleton and his battle-torn wounds are amazing. Winston actually comments that the makeup had improved so much since the last movie that they rarely needed to rely on animatronics at all. The makeup effects on Arnold that we have, the chrome aspect of him, the underskin aspect of him, all of these things we learned from the first how to make them better. 
Computer graphics animator Steve Williams says that one of the most difficult things to do is to create the illusion of plasticity with the T-1000. One of the biggest problems in Terminator was to try and give an illusion of plasticity. So pieces of, them, of geometry were falling off, yet it was totally smooth and not showing any uh, hard cut lines. One particularly challenging scene was the one where Patrick's character shifts through metal bars. This was achieved using computer animated bars and a rotoscope computer generated image of Robert Patrick that was laid over the actual footage of Patrick, creating the illusion of putty. I mean, I even heard one guy sitting behind me go, you know, I know they did that show, they did it using jelly. In fact, it wasn't, but it was supposed to create the illusion of that. And you have to start with storyboards. You have to know what you're doing at the beginning. Can it even be done? A show like this, you know, is it technically feasible to even do it now? Murin also notes that the process of digitizing film was relatively new at this point, so they had to figure that process out as well. We had to figure out how we could just digitize film so we could do all the, the digital work we need to do in the middle, all the software uh, you know, generation of images and all, and then get it back on film. That was a major hurdle. Interestingly, T2 would use some early examples of mocap while working out the T-1000 walking scenes. The special effects team painted a grid on Robert Patrick and used that to study his motion, and then went on to build animated bones and skin around it. What was special about Terminator 2 was this was the first time we were going to marry these technologies. We were going to marry live action, puppeted effects with digital effects. And when an element of T2 worked up to a certain point and didn't work anymore, we were now in the digital world. It was one of the final shots of the film, the T-1000 death scene, where it boils and burns from the inside out, that turned out to be one of the most difficult. That took weeks and weeks to render, Murin explains. Some of the frames went down to silicon graphics. Some of them went to universities across the country. We had connections with render farms here, render farms there, and then we could finally put all those frames together to get that shot. Of course, the practical effects and stunt work deserve just as much praise as the CGI. I mean the canal chase scene. It's literally one of the greatest chase scenes of all time. Not only is the scene exhilarating, but it also showcases some of the best stunt work ever and some very clever editing. While it seems like the whole chase is taking place in one location, the scene was actually filmed across 10 miles. The set utilized hidden walls and concealed stunt ramps that allowed the giant truck to gain the momentum it needed to get all that air. The crew also had to build out a concrete divider for the truck to ram into, as the bridge canal didn't have anything like that. Meanwhile, the motorcycle used for the stunts was an actual Harley Davidson, not a lightweight stunt vehicle. You see, typically, there's a separate, non-standard vehicle used for these kinds of risky jumps, but Cameron felt that switching out the bike would be too distracting, so instead of that, stunt coordinator Joel Kramer configured two construction cranes to suspend the Harley and stuntman Peter Kent in the air. The wiring was removed in post-production, and voila, you have an incredibly believable and realistic motorcycle jump. And of course, this scene showcases some of the brilliant industrial light and magic special effects work when the T-1000 rises from the wreckage in his shiny liquid metal form. In the end, the shoot itself was quick by blockbuster standards, with principal photography taking place between October 1990 and March of 1991. From there, the movie was edited and rushed out pretty quickly in order to hit a coveted early summer release that July. The effects team for T2 won quite a few awards for their work here. The film received an Academy Award for Best Visual Effects and Best Makeup, as well as a British Academy Film Award for Best Special Visual Effects. For cast and crew, Terminator 2 has been more than a reunion. It has been very intense. There were, you know, a lot of night shooting and a lot of long hours and so on. There are some pretty compelling reasons that T2 still tops the list as one of the greatest action films of all time, and one of the greatest sequels ever made. It adds a whole heap of nuance to the discussions presented in the first film, recontextualizes the notion of fate, transforms the previous villain into an amazing father figure and unrelenting protector, transforms the previous victim into a Terminator in her own right, all the while introducing a new Terminator that is pretty much as anxiety-inducing as a T-800 cybernetic tank. Come with me if you want to live. Well, that's all for today, folks. If you enjoyed the video, don't forget to hit like and subscribe to stay up to date on all my content. And uh, yeah, if you have any other suggestions, feel free to leave them in the comments below. As always, it's been a pleasure. Niat here with Film Comics Explained. Thanks for stopping by. Hasta la vista, baby.